Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Sunday Morning Bible Study for April 10th, 2011. This morning, Pastor Bob Hillard continues our discussion, What is the Church?, based on Chapter 8 of the Lutheranism 101 book. Let's listen in. Okay, so reading from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. For just as the one body has many members, and all are members of the body, though, ma- though many uh, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And if the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? But that as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, and yet one body. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have baptized us into the body of believers. You have made us to be uh, members of your Son, Jesus, who is our head. And we pray, Lord, that as we discuss today what it means to be a part of the church and what the church is all about, that you would uh, give us wisdom and guidance and direction. Help us, Lord, to uh, hear your leading and, and follow your word faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, everybody did the reading now, I'm sure, right? Good, that was resounding, yes. All right. Uh, let's look up some Bible verses before we get started. Can I get somebody to go to 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17 for me today? Sylvia's got it. Uh, and stay there, because we'll get you to do chapter 12 also. Is that okay? Oh, you're throwing too many numbers at me now. Okay. 10, 12, 13, 10. Okay, I'll do it. 10, all right. Uh, Marcia, if you want to do Ephesians 2, okay. you probably read that part. I did. Uh, that's in the first half. Uh, 14 through 16. Uh, and I'll have you look at Ephesians 4 also. 1 okay. Peter 2, verse 9. So I want to grab that one. Thank you, Doug. 1 uh, Corinthians 1, 2. Thank you, Don. Uh, <coughs> Ephesians, there we that one. Let's so we'll look at Matthew 16, verse 18. Thank you. And that's where we'll be today, I think. Very good. Okay, so uh, last week we talked about uh, what? The church. But bring me up to speed. What did we learn about the church? The, the church is like a body, right? How so? We heard it in our reading this morning, so you can think about it. <coughs> Made up of several parts. Several parts. So every member of the body has a place, right? Uh, one part is not um, less important than another. Good. Um, what else did we learn? We learned something else kind of important. A big distinction in the church. Big C and little C. Big C and little C Catholic, right? Yeah, right. Very good. Uh, big C Catholic meaning Roman Catholic, which is uh, where it is taught that if you want to be a true Christian, you have to be a part of the Roman Catholic Church. What does little C Catholic mean? Talk about it again today if you don't remember. Universal. 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 Good. And we'll talk about that. All right, good. Uh, one other big distinction we talked about last week. Visible and invisible church, right? What's the visible church? The building. I'm sorry? People. No, no. The building? No. Visible church. The body of believers? Nope. What's the invisible church? That is the body. Yes, the all who have faith are is the true church, the invisible church. Why do we call it invisible? Because you don't know. You don't know. You can't see it, right? Invisible things are things you can't see. <laughs> uh, you can't see who has faith, so you don't know. Uh, but how do we know? So the when we ask who is the church, it's invisible. Answers the question who. Invisible. What does that answer? You guys remember this? What question does this answer? Where? Where is the church? 
How do we know where the church is? The two of them are gathered? No. Because you're, you can't tell if those people are believers or not. It's not the people. Where the sacraments are. Sacraments and word. 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 Right. The visible church is where the word is faithfully preached and the sacraments are properly administered. How do we know the church is there? Because of the word. Right. What do we go on? Well, it's the word of God. <coughs> Since God is there, the church is there. That's right. Exactly. Where, where Christ is, there is his church. Uh, the book of Isaiah says, My word will not return to me void. Right? So uh, God's word falls like rain on the ground. And what happens when rain hits the ground? Weeds grow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. That's right. Sometimes they come to Bible study. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and grass grows. It gets green, right? Uh, we love this here in Moore Park and Simi Valley when you drive in on the 118 and you don't just see dirt, but you actually see green hills and it's very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, where the word is spoken, there God creates faith. It doesn't return to him void. Uh, so Christians will be where the word is because the gospel is working there. Okay. So a very big distinction. We want to make sure we draw this distinction for a couple of reasons. One, we want to make we, sure we understand that the who of the church is invisible and not visible. Uh, this is where our Roman Catholic friends run into trouble. They don't draw a distinction here. They say the visible church is the only church. So you can know who's a member of the church of God by looking at the membership roster. Now that's a little trite. That's not entirely fair to them, I'm sure. I'll be getting an email about this from someone who's Roman Catholic, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, basically they say the visible church is the only church. And there is no salvation outside of the church. Right? And what we talked about that. Is that true or false? Is there salvation outside of the church? Yes. yes. If we mean by church Roman Catholic Church, of course. But if we mean by church all who are believers are part of the church, no, there is no salvation outside of the church because if you're a believer, you're part of the church. You can't be a Christian and not part of the church. Those things go together, right? If the church is understood as the invisible believers. Now, the other thing we want to make sure we understand is this. Uh, this might seem like a little nuance, but I, I, it, is, it does become kind of important. We want to make sure we draw this distinction properly, that the visible church is the where of the church and the invisible is the who. Uh, because uh, other denominations will draw this distinction between visible and invisible church. And they'll say the visible church are the people you can see at church, and the invisible church are the actual believers. And so they'll say, everybody who's here on Sunday morning, believer or not, is a part of the visible church. And we would say that's not true. Uh, because if you're not a believer, you're not a part of the church. You might be in a membership role, but you're not a member of the body of Christ. You get to show up, apparently, and watch what we're doing, but you don't have faith, so therefore you're not part of the church. So we wouldn't say that they're part of the visible church, because we wouldn't say they're part of the church at all. Though they participate in and take part in what is going on in the visible church, they're not actually a part of the body. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good. Questions on that stuff? Good. Systematic theology at its finest. Just fun stuff. Okay. Uh, so, what is it that must take place in your life for you to become a part of the church? You must be what? Baptized. Baptized. That's the verses we just read, in fact. 1 Corinthians says that we are baptized into one body. We drink of the same spiritual drink. What do you think that's talking about? Communion. Communion. Yeah, I think we're going to the Lord's Supper on that one. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the sacraments are what, and the word of the sacraments are what bring you into the body. Uh, and when you are in the body, it is because you believe in Jesus. That's what makes you part of the church. Okay, now there's a bunch of descriptive words. This is what we'll focus on today. A bunch of descriptive words that you read about, or you should have read about uh, in your book, uh, that describe what the church is. And we use these in our Nicene Creed. We say that we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, right? Or one holy, Christian, and apostolic church, sometimes we say. In the Apostles' Creed, we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, or you can say Catholic church. There too, little c. Um, excuse me. Now we talk about these things. So what do all of these terms mean? Who's got 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17? I do. All right, go for it. 
Is it not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, and we all partake of the one loaf. All right. What am I use those verses for? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> one body, one loaf. Okay, so what's it referring to there? Again, what is the meal that's talking about? Communion. communion, right? And so when we go to communion, we are not each taking uh, sort of our own sort of spirit. It's not our own sort of spiritual experience there, but rather we're united around the table and we're participating in the one body of Christ. The body of Christ that you receive at the Lord's Supper is the same body of Christ that every other Christian and every other, every other communion service has ever received. And therefore, when Christ comes and we feed on his body and drink his blood, we are united together. There's one church that gathers around the table. Does that make sense? You following me on that? Uh, it's really an interesting concept to know that when we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, we are literally communing with saints at the table, at the altar. It connects us, it unites us with the church that has existed for the past 2,000 years. Uh, we have the same faith, we dine, uh, we feast on the same bread and body. One body, one loaf. Does that make sense? We had the Jehovah's Witnesses come by and invite us to church yesterday. Very nice of them, I'm sure, uh, to invite us to church. Uh, the Mormons have the same problem, where they do not believe that uh, there is a unity of faith from the time of Jesus until the time of Joseph Smith. But in fact, there is a great falling away, um, a great uh, apostasy, there's my word, apostasy, uh, where there were really no true believers until Joseph Smith received his revelation. So from the time of the death of the apostles until Joseph Smith, everything else is sort of mystical nonsense. There's no true believers that they really know of uh, until... Um, Joseph Smith comes again, and actually, or comes the first time. I hope he doesn't come again. I don't know how that works. Uh, we have some problems. Yeah. So, um, the, the, we would disagree with that, and it's interesting how uh, the Lord's table is actually a place where that disagreement is quite clear. We're one church. We're one body. And we're united with every other believer who is alive now and who has ever lived because we receive the same body of Christ. Regardless of what we necessarily believe, it's an objective reality. Do you know what I mean by objective reality? Like if I say the sky is blue, we can't debate that. It just is, right? Uh, the body of Christ is in the bread. It's just there and it unites us, whether we have agreement on what we say about it or not. It's just doing that. Uh, it's, that's reality. It's objective. Uh, very interesting stuff. Okay. We'll talk more about that idea of how there's no, I mean, there's always been true believers because Christ says the gates of hell will not prevail against my church and the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses don't have any clue what to do with those verses um, because they believe the gates of hell did prevail against the church for a long time. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13. You got that one too. 12. 12 what? 12 through 13. Is that a Kindle? What is that? Yeah. It's oh, on my phone. Oh, that, okay. Okay. That's going to be a lot so faster 12, than the Kindle. 12, 12, 1 through 13? No, 12, 12, 12 through 13. 12, 12. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we, all, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Okay. So... Is there, is there a class system within the church? No. We're all part of one body. We've been part, brought into the same body. This is very significant, especially for St. Paul when he's writing. Who's got uh, Ephesians 2, 14 through 6? And you want to read that one for me? For he himself is our peace, who, he, who had made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. 
All right, so what's, ta- what's going on here, the two becoming one, what, what Paul is talking about here in the book of Ephesians, St. Paul, the guy who writes most of our New Testament, and also in Colos- uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, um, Paul is saying this, uh, in those days it was believed that uh, Jesus, the Messiah, was going to come for the Jews. And the Gentiles might get to be blessed by this, but it was primarily for the Jews. And when the Messiah came, it would be giving power and authority to the Jewish people, and then they would rule and lord themselves over the rest of the world. They were the body of believers. They were the church, and everyone else was sort of second-class citizens. All right, The Gentiles were sort of second-class. But what Paul is saying here is that in Christ, there is no distinction. The, the wall of hostility has been destroyed because Christ comes for all of humanity, Jew and Gentile. Col- uh, Galatians says, there is no distinction, Jew or, free, uh, Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, all are one in Christ Jesus. Therefore, within the church, everybody is saved in the same way. Salvation comes to everyone in the exact same way. All right? Nobody is saved because they're Jewish. It's only by faith. Nobody is saved because they're a Gentile. It's only by faith. We have one faith in one cross through one baptism, and that is what saves us. So there's one church made up of all kinds of different people. Okay? Now, we might not believe this because we're Lutherans, and we might believe that the church is just simply white German people, but it's not true. <laughs> okay? Uh, the church is much bigger than that. Um, and so what's very interesting about this, you guys, uh, is, is when we talk about, um, like when we talk about doing Hispanic ministry here, for example, people will think, well, what's that going to do to our church? Well, we got to be careful with that language. we got to think about that, right? Because whose church is it? God. It's Jesus' church. And if you're a believer, you're a part of the church, of this congregation, which is his. And so there's no distinction. And so we do what we can to make sure that there is unity amidst diversity. Okay? Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, diversity is a big topic, a very popular topic in our world right now. And uh, diversity, unity within diversity is a good thing. Of course, we like to make it something it isn't and say, oh, that means we should welcome in everybody who believes whatever they believe, right? And we should all be united with everybody, regardless, we need to coexist. And then we have the great bumper stickers that say coexist, because apparently we don't coexist in America. I don't get that. Uh, but they're all written with fun letters that make them look like all the religions should get along. That's not what we're saying here. We're not united with people who deny Jesus. It's a very different thing. But all who have faith are one in Christ, regardless of uh, color or ethnicity or weight or whatever. Okay? Age. None of that stuff. Make sense? Got to keep that in mind. So there's one church that we are united with throughout the world. Um... Other thing to keep on mind there is then what unites us, what uh, keeps us one, uh, is our faith in the same Jesus and nothing else. Um, however, unity can be expressed through things we do. So it used to be, uh, who grew up in the Missouri Senate? Anybody here at all? All right. So you could go to uh, any church on Sunday morning. And you would get the exact same service out of the exact same hymnal, right? So you could be here. No. Maybe not the same hymnal. Well, blue or red, yeah, there's a big war about this. But uh, green. green, sure, yeah, if you were part of that Lutheran church that <laughs> took the green hymnal like we did. Um, <laughs> you know the story of the green hymnal? The Missouri Senate, if you opened up the green hymnal, yeah. said Missouri Senate and all the denominations. And then they backed out. The Missouri Senate backed out after it already went to print. <laughs> so, like, all these churches had ordered it. They got their names in it. And the Missouri Senate said, no, we don't, we don't, there's too many things we don't like about it. I'm glad we don't have the video today. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> and I looked through it, you know, and there's some of the things I wasn't always a big fan of in there either, but, um, okay, whatever. So, anyhow, it used to be in the Missouri Senate uh, a long time ago. You had the red hymnal. T-L-H. And any Missouri Senate church you would go to, you would come across T-L-H. And that's how you knew you were in the one true holy apostolic Christian church. Because you had the T-L-H. <laughs> Unity and worship. 
And we said we were united, and we demonstrate that unity by our practice. And there's some wisdom in that. In fact, there's a lot of wisdom in that. Um, and, and we shouldn't just sort of laugh it off right away, because there's actually, it's very wonderful to know that we're united, that we're worshiping in the same way, because we're worshiping the same God. Problem is, is when you run to the other extreme, and say you're only united if you worship the same way, and if you're not worshiping the same way, you're out. This is what the reformers deal with uh, with Roman Catholicism. Catholics said, here's the mass, here's how you do it, and you can't have any breaks, no differences. You can't even do it in your own language. It has to be in Latin. And so the confessors in the Augsburg Confession, I get so excited when I get to open this book, uh, they say this, um, it is, if for it is enough, this is in the Augsburg Confession concerning the church. This is enough for the true unity of the Christian church, that there be the gospel preached harmoniously according to the pure understanding of the... And the uh, start over. For this is enough for the true unity of the Christian church, that there the gospel is preached harmoniously according to a pure understanding, and the sacraments are administered in conformity with the divine word. So what do you need for the true church? Word and sacrament, according to the word of God. All right, not making up stuff about them, not changing what the Bible says about them. You just preach the word, you administer the sacraments like the Bible tells you. It is not necessary for the true unity of the Christian church that uniform ceremonies instit instituted by human beings be observed everywhere. Uh, for Paul says in Ephesians, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Um, so in other words... For there to be true unity, we don't have to have outward unity. It's primarily unity of faith, unity of belief, right? Uh, however, that being said, later on the Reformers say, but we strive for unity in practice because it shows that we're together in this thing. It shows we're united on this. We're not going to require it. We're not going to bind you to this. But it shows that we are together in this, that we believe the same things, uh, that, that we're working together. Does that make sense? Do you see that distinction there? Okay, um, it's just, just some stuff, food for thought to think about when we talk about what does our worship service need to look like. We are not our own autonomous island with no association with any other church around us. We're united. We're part of one body, a universal body. And so we have to give credence to what it is they're doing and how we are taking part in that. At the same time, we do live in a different place. We're not going to do our services in Latin or German. Um, no matter how much my wife would like a German service, Don just doesn't want to preach. So we are stuck with English, uh, and it needs to be that way. Further, we're not living just in, uh, you know, the 11th century with monotone, boring music. We have other options, options for us, and so we can play with styles of music a little bit. But some things need to stay in the service. Some things need to stay when we gather together as believers, and those are things that are for the word and the sacrament. And so basically, when we're designing a worship service, or we have a worship service, we have to ask ourselves the question, what do these songs, what do these elements in the service do to promote the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments? Does that make sense? What is it doing for these things? And so what I want you to try and do actually some take home with this uh, when you go to church listen to the songs and then listen to the readings and see how they tie in together if they tie in together and if not you can make fun of me afterwards and that's fine uh, but what we're trying to do what I'm trying to do when I design the service is to have the themes work throughout the day so that what we're singing actually enforces what we're talking about in the message or in the scriptures does that make sense? when we go to the Lord's Supper we have those songs we sing before we attend the supper in the second service, the first service you have the liturgy written out, but in the second service, we include some kind of song, like we sing the Lamb of God, or we sing um, um, Just As I Am, or something like that, because it puts us in the right mindset to go to the altar and receive the body and blood of Christ. The words we're saying there apply to what we're about to be doing. So it's, a, it's really a dynamic kind of thing taking place in our worship service. We're interacting with the word, the objective gifts that God is giving us, we are, we are ourselves interacting with them through the words we say, the songs that we sing, and all that kind of stuff. We're not just showing up to sing the worship songs we like, hearing a, a speech about the Bible, and then going home. We're actually interacting with God's work on us. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, we try and do a good job of it around here. Uh, we being, I don't know why I keep saying we all the time. I'm the one who puts the service together. Uh, so if you don't like it, 
talk to Linda, the secretary. Okay. Um, so one church united um, around the one message. There's one church because there's one message. Okay. Um, we'll talk about denominations. Maybe not today. Maybe today. Uh, what does that mean? Well, let's just do that real quick. What does that mean about all the denominational differences we have? Are there really, is there really one church? Because, I mean, you look, we got at least 20 in Moore Park, and Moore Park's have 40,000 people. I mean, uh, there's a lot of churches here. How can we, how can we be so uh, bold to say there's only one church? What do we do with those denominations? On page 110, it's got a list of church denominations. Does it really? Yeah. <laughs> Good, that helps our argument, right? Um, oh, that's very helpful. Uh, that, yeah, that's an interesting page. I did remember reading this page. At the bottom, it talks about a denomination of Baptists that believes the Lord's Supper is actually the body and blood. I, I want to know what denomination that is. That's remarkable. I wish they would have said. Um, yeah, very interesting stuff here. Uh, this is a nice way of breaking it up. Um, so, there you go. Why don't we get together with them for church on Sunday? If there's one church that's united by faith, why don't we get together with them? Because they believe in some man-made things. Sure. Yeah, I think that's the right way of saying it. Uh, some man-made doctrines have been introduced. Praise the Lord that we have the Lutheran Church where no man-made doctrines have been introduced. Uh, I say that sarcastically, but I hope you're here because on some level you believe that. Uh, that we are as close as it gets to being faithful to the Word of God. That's why I'm a pastor in this church because out of the other denominations, I don't think they're as close as Lutheranism is. I really do think Lutheranism has the pure gospel and the right understanding of the sacraments. Um, that's why I'm here. Uh, it's a good thing. If I were Presbyterian, I'd be lying to you guys every week. And here, it just becomes very interesting when you think about this, because we want to strive for unity, and so we make unity our ultimate goal, um, so that everything else sort of gets left by the wayside. Go ahead. I just want to ask a question on what you just said. Yes. Um, when you were in seminary, mm -hmm. did you actually look at, like, Methodist, Presbyterian, yeah. and, and, and read that, and, and I mean, and say... I did, I did that in college. Okay. Yeah, I had a yeah, Christian... I, well, both in college and seminary, I had classes talking about what the other denominations teach and believe and sort of mm -hmm. going through the main thing and sort of getting what's behind what they teach, so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, I have looked at all of those, and uh, I really do... I, in fact, in college, I decided I was uh, uh, going to be a Baptist, a Calvinistic Baptist, um, and so I called my dad, and he said, open your Bible. And it was a nice conversation. Um, but uh, I really did think Lutherans were wrong uh, for about a year uh, or so. Yeah, I've gone to some Baptist church where, I mean, I don't know all the insides of it, but I've heard some pretty good sermons. Well, now, now, okay, right. Now, this is not to say that other denominations are not Christians, right? And you will hear a lot of Baptists and a lot of Presbyterians and uh, saying some very wonderful things. I mean, if you ever listen to White Horse Inn, for example, there's a Lutheran guy on there, but there's a bunch of other guys. R.C. Sproul's a Presbyterian. If you ever hear him on the radio, he's remarkably good, uh, but he's a little off on some things, we would say. Um, I mean, there's a lot of good Christians who aren't Lutherans, and we don't, we don't hear me saying something besides that. Mm -hmm. However, I would say that there are things in their theology that go a little stray from the scriptures. Um, and so we want to make sure we're always going back to what the Bible teaches. Um, so, and, and, yeah, so the reason why we then don't pretend to have unity with those churches is because we don't have unity with those churches. We don't believe the same things. We believe in the Apostles' Creed, we believe in the Resurrection and the Trinity, and that's why we can all be called Christians, but there are some very significant teachings that we disagree about. Uh, and, and if we are to try and pretend like we're united, it's actually going to create more divisions and more pain. For example, one missionary I know uh, was telling me that he's, you know, he's helping plant churches and they got some guys in leadership there. And one of the guys in leadership uh, began to deny infant baptism. He said, you should not baptize babies. 
And so every time infant baptism would come up or there'd be a baptism in the church, that leader would go around handing out pamphlets saying why infant baptism is false um, and start talking to people about why you shouldn't be doing infant baptism. That's a problem. If you can't be united around what you're hearing and you start to create divisions within the church, you need to leave. And so it would be a problem if I'm going to a Presbyterian church and teaching Lutheran doctrine. We might call that evangelism too, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I'm joking. But you would say that uh, I'm creating this unity there. And I shouldn't be a part of that church. If I don't believe what they're saying, why am I going? Right? And so if there is disunity, let's call it what it is. And then begin to talk about it. And then start working through where we disagree as opposed to pretending like we have agreement. Um, I've told you all that, that I've been talking with a Roman Catholic guy in, in Portugal because he saw our video on, on YouTube. Uh, and the, the nice thing about our conversations is we can actually say to one another, we don't agree, so let's talk about our disagreements and why I think you're wrong. And the, it, it's remarkably so much more fruitful than trying to shove our differences underneath the table and say, oh, no, we, we definitely agree on this, we definitely agree on that. Well, we really don't. So why lie about it, pretend like we're, we're united when we're not? Um, and so the church, I think, with its denominational differences, is called to love and serve each other by sitting down and discussing our differences, actually working through them, uh, but not pretending like we're all united on something. Make sense? We are united in an objective sense. We are united because we're baptized. And God united us that way. It's amazing. He did it. He baptized us and put us into the same body. We just don't seem to get along so well. Uh, one foot keeps kicking the other. It seems. Um, so that's a way you, we just have to learn to work with that. And hopefully we pray for unity, we strive towards unity, but we don't pretend to be united when we're not. And that's okay. All right? Very good. Okay. I wanted to go through all four of these. I thought these would each take five minutes. Um, anything else on the unity of the church, denominational differences, being one body? Good. Okay. Next. Uh, who's got Ephesians 4, 4 through 6? I do. Wow, you got that too. Good. I think that's what you told me. Oh, I did. And then also 1 Peter 2, 9. I don't have that. I have that. 4 through 6? Mm -hmm. There was one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That would have been really good for our last section. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, good. That uh, just reinforced what we said. Uh, 1 Peter 2 9, what does that one say? But you are a chosen people, Here we are. a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness and into His wonderful light. What does it mean to be holy? Set apart for God. Set apart for God, right? We belong to Him. You are a special, chosen, holy, sanctified people. If you're set apart for God, that also means you're purified because God can have nothing impure in His presence. So to be holy means to be washed in the blood of Christ. So the church is holy, not because, and here's what we don't want to do. We don't want to say the church is holy because there's a bunch of good moral people sitting in here although you might like to think of yourselves that way, but I know better. Uh, we are sinners, but we can call ourselves holy. Why? Because we are washed in the blood of Christ, covered in the blood of the Lamb. Every single Sunday, when we gather around the altar, that happens again and again and again. Um, we are washed and cleansed. We are holy, sanctified people. We are made holy, declared holy. We're holy because God says so. And that will hopefully prayerfully translate into good moral living and being nice people and praying for others and all of that business, but that's not what makes us holy. It's just what holy people start doing. Okay? Okay. Next one. First Corinthians one verse two. God. To the church of God in Corinth, to the to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and call to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. All right. Uh, this goes along with the one, uh, but here's what we'll call the Catholic Church or universal. Yeah, just 
I like in your, our book it says the church is Christian. Of course it's Christian, but it's better to say one holy Catholic or universal church. Th- that is to say, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and saying you guys are a part of all believers everywhere, united, universal. You get it? I mean, we, we kind of beat that one to death, okay? That's Good. a lowercase c, right? Yes, <laughs> except that... Uh, I'm writing them point by point, and proper grammar would have me start with an uppercase. Okay, good. Uh, Last one, and this is a great one to end on. Uh, Apostolic, Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Who's got that one? Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Sorry. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. All right. Built on the foundation of what? The apostles. The apostles and prophets. We say we are a holy Christian Catholic apostolic church. Now, when we say apostolic, we are not referring to the church that used to meet here who calls themselves the apostolic congregation because they believe their pastors were uh, literally ver- verbally called by God on street corners and told to go do it. They were themselves apostles of Christ. That's dangerous stuff. Um, but when we say we're apostolic, we mean we're built on the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. That's interesting stuff. Where do we get those teachings? The Bible. Yeah, we're built on the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. The Bible, what they wrote for us. Okay. Um, the Roman Catholics go off here because they say uh, the Pope has been given the seat of the apostles, and therefore what he says is an apostolic teaching and thus binding on the church. So they can start teaching things like uh, Mary is a co-redeemer and the Pope is infallible and he is just like uh, when Peter would write letters or Paul would write letters when the Pope gives official statements it's on par with the Bible that's very dangerous stuff it's very dangerous stuff we're built on the apostles and the prophets what the, what the apostles teach us now we might get trouble with this and we might say well I thought we were built on Jesus well what are the apostles and the prophets talking about Jesus, okay, so don't worry, it's, we're still found on Jesus, it's okay. Jesus is the chief cornerstone of what they taught, according to Ephesians. So it all comes back to Christ. The prophets, Jesus says, they were pointing to me, and you can't read the New Testament and think it's about anybody besides Jesus, though we work really hard to think it's about uh, us. It's really about Christ. Uh, and so everything is built on that foundation. Uh, in fact, this is what Jesus says to Peter, who's got... Matthew 16. I do. Go for it. What was the verse? Verse 18. 16. That's why it was on that page. And I tell you that you are Peter. I tell you that you are Peter. On this rock I build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Okay. Okay. I tell you that you are Peter on this rock, I will build my church. So Jesus has just asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And some say, well, some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Some people say you're the great prophet. And Jesus says, that's very good. Who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and he says, we believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, yes, that is right, Peter. And uh, that's right. And you are therefore Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. You know what the word Peter means? Rock. Petros. Um, if you've ever heard, uh, that's Greek for, for rock. And Jesus says, I'm giving you the name rock. And then he says, on this rock I will build my church. And the Roman Catholics take that and they say, see, Peter is the first pope. And whatever the Pope teaches, therefore, it's binding on all of us because Peter's the first Pope and he's the rock of the church and Jesus builds on Peter. This gets nuanced, but it's very important for us to understand because we don't grab it in the English. In the Greek, there is a tense change when he says, you are Peter, you are the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. And when he says on this rock, he's not referring, and you can see this in the Greek, he can't see it in the English, he, or anything else, I guess. Uh, he's referring not to Peter, but to Peter's confession. And what did Peter say? You are the Christ, and on this rock, I, or, or, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is saying on that confession, on that teaching, 
On that word, I will build my church. Which is another way of saying, the church is built on me. I'm the chief cornerstone of the whole thing. It's not that Peter's the first pope or something like this, but even if it does mean, (laughs) even if Jesus does say, on you, Peter, I'm building my church, he's not talking about Peter himself. He's talking about what Peter's going to teach. And this is hardly, even if he does mean, Peter, I'm building it on you, we can hardly say that this therefore means that the seat of the Pope is the seat of the Vicar of Christ who now speaks on behalf of the church and what he says is binding and he's authoritative and infallible and all of that kind of business. It's just like a huge leap from right there. Jesus is building on what Peter said, that Christ is Lord, the Son of God. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, Really important stuff there. Uh, We are built on what the apostles say. Therefore, we don't get to make church whatever we want it to be. We don't get to create this sort of social organization that we find entertaining or helpful. We're built on what the apostles teach. It's got to be biblical. Everything we do in the church has got to be biblical. Bible is our foundation. So everything we're doing, we've got to look at it through the lens of the scriptures. Is this being faithful? Is this what we're called to do? Is this where Christ is leading us? Is this what the church is supposed to be doing? Make sense? Good. All right. Um couple other things and then and then we'll go to church just so we can get done with this chapter uh, the, it also says in your book that the church is triumphant as well as militant if you look in our new hymnals uh, that unite us all in the one true faith if you look at the hymnals in there on the top there's always these headers for the theme of what you're looking at uh, there's two sections in there now which I really like there's a section called the church then there's a ch- section called the church militant and then there's a section called the church triumphant the church militant refers to those of us believers who are still alive, kicking and militant, fighting, right? Uh, We're still in the midst of a battle. Satan hates us. The world hates us. Death still attacks us. Uh, These things are going on, and we will fight these things until Christ comes again. We are the church at war. But if we die before Christ returns, where do we go? The presence of Christ. We're in triumph. We're already triumphant now because we belong to Jesus, though we are still in battle. When we die, the battle ends, and we are in the presence of our victorious Jesus. There you go. So, uh, on All Saints Day, we'll sing for all the saints, and we think about the church triumphant. Um, Those of us who have friends who have died in the faith, loved ones who have died in the faith, they're in the presence of Christ, victorious, the church triumphant, but still the church, always the body of Christ. Good. Anything else? Questions on that stuff? Lovely. Great. Uh, this is big stuff, you guys. Uh, the, the big doctrines, the big theologies we always talk about, what are the big controversies and issues in the church? The big one in our day seems to be, what is the church? What is this organization of people? How are we to understand ourselves? It's what everyone seems to be writing about. Um, it seems to be what all the Christians are talking about these days. What's the purpose and function of the church? Um, and there we have it. All right, two weeks off. You're welcome. <laughs> Next week, come watch Confirmation Kids get drilled with questions. <laughs> so still come at 915. That'd be wonderful if you show up. Uh, then the next week is Easter. And then the following week, we're back. Um, and so I will give you a reading assignment for that. Hey, Mike. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> If you want to read this little, on page 87, I guess, this little blurb, Lutheran spirituality, it'll probably be very fruitful for you. Um, be pretty interesting stuff there. Uh, chapter 10, skim it, examples of faith. Just skim chapter 10. Spend most of your time on 11 and 12. Um, that's what we'll probably start looking at. Cool. All right, that'll be good enough for now. Thanks, everybody. Go to church. For more information on Faith Lutheran Church of Moore Park, California, and for more podcast episodes like this one, visit us on the web at www.faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.